over pensions and welfare to lie in this Parliament where they can be dealt with properly rather than left in the hands of a Tory government. We now come to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm sure the whole chamber will want to join me in congratulating Eve Muirhead in her rink on winning the bronze medal at the Winter Olympics. Perhaps uh, that's a demonstration that we all can be heroes just for one day. <laughs> And of course, th those of us on this side would, of course, congratulate um, our curlers. We're very proud of them, both as Scots and part of the UK GB team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask the First Minister to turn and face the strain? In the last seven days, the Chancellor, the Shadow Chancellor, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury, the STUC, the CBI and the Institute of Directors have all said both his plans A and B for the currency were non-starters. The President of the EU Commission and the President of the EU Council said his Europe plans were, at best, extremely difficult. Instead of arguing why he is right and they are wrong, the First Minister has just insulted them. Now that David Bowie has come out... Order. I don't realise perhaps you hadn't noticed he was insulting people rather than <laughs> arguing with them. However, now that David Bowie has come out for the union, can the First Minister explain to us why Bowie is preposterous, bluffing and bullying? First Minister. Uh, I, I, I think uh, in terms of insult, most people in Scotland it would feel that George Osborne insulted the intelligence of the Scottish people. Yeah. Uh, this may be the last time, and probably the only time, that I'll quote the Daily Mail. Uh, <laughs> but I think when Joanne Lamont is uh, facing headlines in the Daily Mail, row over pound drives yes vote, then there might be a, a reasonable conclusion that the indications that we have so far is that the joint enterprise between George Osborne and Ed Balls has backfired on the two unionist parties in spectacular fashion. I, I watched television the, the other night and I, I saw Gordon Brown walk off an interview on STV because he was asked whether Ed Balls was wise to make an alliance with George Osborne. I've never seen, I mean, I've known Gordon Brown for a long time, I've never seen him walk off an interview. Perhaps people of the Labour Party should realise the damage that's been done to them yes. by standing hand in glove with the likes of George Osborne. Yes. Joanne Lemon. Perhaps, perhaps the First Minister. Ms. Lamont. Perhaps the First Minister might reflect on the damage being done to this Parliament by the insults he presents to our intelligence and the people of Scotland about the way, in which, the way in which he dismisses those who disagree with him. It takes an extraordinary lack of self-awareness for the First Minister to accuse other people of not telling the truth as a campaigning tactic. Truly, as you live your life, you judge your neighbour. The fact of the matter is, these are too serious for the, the First Minister to insult us in this way. This week, Alex Salmond, John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon have been repeatedly asked to put a figure on the transaction costs to Scottish business that will come with giving up the pound in the event of a yes vote, but have refused to come up with an answer. Which refused to come up with an answer. But the Scottish Parliament Information Centre has come up with some numbers. Transaction costs for the rest of the UK, the so-called George tax, work out at £9 per head for people in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But if the Scottish Government's own figures are to be believed, the cost in Scotland would be £75 a head, eight times greater. No wonder, no wonder they wouldn't answer the question. Given this would be the consequence of his plan to break up the United Kingdom, why should Scottish business pay the Alex tax? Yeah. First Minister. I don't know, John Lamont. 
our proposal is to share the pound <laughs> and not have the transaction cost. It's her proposal, that is Ed Balls and George Arthur. Osborne's proposal, to force Scotland into a different currency and impose transaction costs on Scottish and English business. The point that was being made by the Scottish Government, I think, is a reasonable one. I don't think English businesses will take kindly to being forced to pay the George or Joan tax. I don't think that Joanne Lamont is wants to have her name attached to the same tax as George Osborne. Now, I, I, I said earlier uh, that I wasn't going to... It was the only time I was going to quote the Daily Mail, <laughs> but I'm going to quote it, I guess. <laughs> Twice in one session. And I do apologise for, for quoting Labour's House Journal, but nonetheless... <laughs> I noticed another aspect of the poll this morning showed that our proposal to share the pound was the most popular proposal among the Scottish people. Yeah. Does, that not suggest, does that not suggest that perhaps there's a, a resonance in support of what we are saying and the Labour Party are struggling because of their association with the Conservative Party? And I, I, mean, I hope John Lambert continues with this because I might go for the hat trick and start talking about the party ratings that that poll indicated. Yeah. The Labour Party have done themselves huge damage yeah. by associating with the Conservatives and in particular George Osborne. The reaction of the Scottish people to being told, instructed from on high that our currency, the currency that we jointly built up, actually doesn't belong to us, it belongs to George Osborne, I think is entirely understandable and will be deeply uncomfortable for the Labour Party in Scotland. To our moment. Ms. Lamont. If we're talking about associations with Tories, it's only the SNP who want to cut corporation tax by three pence more than any Tory Chancellor would propose. Three pence more. And if, we're talking, if we're talking about polls, the same poll, the same poll, the same poll says that two-thirds of the people in this country want to know what the First Minister proposal is for a plan B for the currency, and it's about time he told them. Because the reality is this, the rest of the United Kingdom, including Carwin Jones, have said they do not want a currency union. They don't want a currency union. You can't make them have a currency union if you're not in the same country. What do you not understand? What do you not understand? What does the Arthur. First Minister What does the First Minister not understand about his proposal to take Scotland out of the United Kingdom? It has come to this presiding officer. The Scottish Government, as we have seen, is prepared to deny, deflect, assert and insult in order to win this referendum. They say they want to keep a currency union. They say they want to keep an unfettered single market without transaction costs. They say they want to keep borrowing costs in line with current levels. They say they want to stay in the EU with a rebate and the current opt-outs. And then they ask, what is the positive case for the union? Isn't the truth? Isn't the truth? that the only way we guarantee keeping those things is by staying in the United yeah. Kingdom. First Minister, order. Well, I'll let me support Joanne Lamont's call for a calm and considered debate <laughs> as, we, <laughs> as we look forward to these things. We've argued, and the Fiscal Commission said that the best option for Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom was to share the currency. That was the basis on which the Fiscal Commission Working Group put forward that policy. I think that is the right policy. I think it's the right policy for Scotland. I think it's the right policy for the rest of the United Kingdom. But can I say to John Lamont, in terms of uh, uh, Mr Barroso's comments, uh, the debate has kind of moved on, has it not? I'm looking at the Scotsman website from today in terms of evidence uh, being presented uh, uh, to this Parliament. Uh, Scottish independence, but also incorrect on the EU. Uh, not me speaking, but uh, uh, Jim Curry, uh, former Director General, uh, who says that uh, he was extremely unwise and incorrect. Uh, if that is not enough, uh, the speech in Ireland of the Secretary General of the Commission 
On Scotland's position regarding membership, should it vote for independence, Ms Day said comments by the European Commission President uh, Mr Bross over the weekend had been misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I think, as civil service speak for, perhaps the comparison uh, between Scotland and Kosovo was not the wisest comparison to make uh, by Mr. Barroso. Can, I mean, Joanne Lamont should look at the evidence being presented to this Parliament's committees. Evidence presented in significant form by uh, people as, uh, as eminent as David Edwards and many, many others, which shows absolutely that Scotland, who has been part of this. European Union for, for 40 years, who have built up rights and entitlements as part of, of that structure, who conform to the democratic imperatives that the EU represent, of course we are entitled to our rights as European citizens. Uh, and the idea that the rest of Europe uh, is wanting to deny us these rights is a total illusion cooked up by the Unionist parties. Yes. Scotland is a European nation. Yes. We shall continue to be a European yes. nation. Order, Joanne Lamont. The real problem with this is that the First Minister only listens to people who agree with him. <laughs> and it works. It works. It works in here, but it doesn't work in the rest of the world. It is not in the First Minister's gift to tell people in England, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, in Europe, what is in their best interest. It is in their gift, and he has to deal with that. The Permanent Secretary to the Treasury has rejected the currency union if there is a yes vote. So too is the Chancellor, the Shadow Chancellor, and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. The CBI, the Institute of Directors, and the STUC reject the idea too. It is not good enough simply to listen to yourselves. You have to accept other people have a credible position. The President of the EU Commission and the President of the Council of Ministers have said Scotland getting the agreement of all the other member states after a yes vote would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Business costs up £75 a head. Average mortgages up an eye-watering £100 a week, and I am sure people across the country will reflect how little seriousness the SNP backbenchers put on the consequences for ordinary people. For despite all of this, despite all of this, the First Minister still simply steams ahead. Isn't it the case that the only preposterous bullying bluffer in this fight is the First Minister himself? First Minister. Uh, can, 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 can I quote from uh, Professor Christine Bell, Constitutional uh, Professor of Law at Edinburgh University? And I've no, uh, sorry, I have no knowledge whatsoever of Christine Bell's uh, politics and whether she agrees with me or not uh, politically. Uh, she says, quote, Legally under international law, the position is clear. If the remainder of the UK keeps the name and status of the UK under international law, it keeps its liabilities for the debt. The UK took out the debt. Legally, it owes the money. Scotland cannot, therefore, default. Now, as Joanne Lamont knows, we have set out in, in the White Paper our proposal that we should share the assets and liabilities of the United Kingdom. We think that is the fair, responsible thing to do. Exactly. And one of these assets is, of course, the Bank of England, which was nationalised in 1946. It is undoubtedly a, a public asset. We think that is a fair proposition to put forward. What we have pointed out, and very reasonably, that the implication, in fact the certainty, because of course the Treasury has had to state this to, to the markets last month, uh, that if you argue, as the Treasury is now doing, as the UK Government, all these eminent people that Joanne Lamont has cited, that they are the continuing state, that they keep all of the assets of the United Kingdom, then it follows, as night follows day, that they end up with the liabilities. And the reason that I believe George Osborne and Ed Balls are bluffing it is not just that it would be against the interests of the English people to impose transaction costs into Scotland, is I don't believe we'll get to a situation where George Osborne wants to make every person in Scotland £25,000 richer, which is what would happen if the UK had to accept all of the national debt. <laughs> you see, 
Unlike Joanne Lamont, I would find agreeing with George Osborne extremely uncomfortable. That is why the Labour Party are suffering serious and perhaps permanent damage in Scotland by their alliance with a Conservative Party. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no current plans, uh, although we may both be in Aberdeen, in the Aberdeen area at least, on Monday. Ms Davidson. I'm sure the First Minister's hotel will be of a higher standard. Um, <laughs> on the currency issue, Presiding Officer, let's summarise where we've gotten to so far today. On one side of the argument, we have Alex Salmond. On the other side of the argument, we have everyone else. And hasn't his response today been telling? Order. As if to make my point for me, thank you very much. Uh, the First Minister of Wales says he doesn't want a currency union with an independent Scotland, and he's ignored. The Permanent Secretary to the Treasury says he wouldn't advise one, and he's dismissed. The Chancellor and his opposite numbers say that they could not, in all conscience, support this for the rest of the UK, and it's a bluff. Alex Salmond's own independence allies say they want a separate currency and they are sidelined. The Institute of Directors and the CBI say the risks to business are unacceptable and they are unionist stooges. And the majority of people in the rest of the UK say no too. They were called in aid of the First Minister's argument when the figures helped him out last week. They're ignored when they don't this week. The First Minister may still be in denial, but the rest of the country has woken up to the truth. Isn't this the week that we found out the Emperor's got no clothes? First Minister. You know, far, far, far be it for me to, to, to remind Ruth Davidson that the Fiscal Commission Working Group uh, contained two Nobel laureates uh, in economics, Jim Millies, Jim Millies uh, and Joe Stieglitz. Now, uh, as well as other eminent uh, economists, and we acted on their recommendation as the best option. I, I think Sir James Millies is particularly interesting in, uh, in that uh, reference, of course, because when Mark Carney gave his balanced and excellent speech uh, in Edinburgh a few weeks ago, he only mentioned two economists in that speech, only cited two economists. One was Adam Smith, and we would agree that Adam Smith is a, a, a great uh, founder of the economic science. And the second economist that Mark Carney cited was Sir James Murleys. Now, does Ruth Davidson actually think when Mark Carney made that citation in his speech, he was unaware that James Murleys was one of the authors of the Fiscal Commission Working Group on whose recommendations we yeah. acted. Now, she checks her head, but she started her question by saying that nobody agreed with me. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm pointing out that Nobel laureate economists in the Fiscal Working Group put forward the proposition. Uh, and as for the people, and let's remember the people, I'm sure that the poll indicates today, having managed to half the no lead in the space of one speech, <laughs> that whatever else you might say, the Scottish people do not agree with George Osborne. Bruce Davidson. The sand is shifting beneath his feet as he stands up and speaks. We've made her. Order. Order. We've made our choice. We've made our choice. We want a strong Scotland in a strong United Kingdom. That already gives us the currency union that he so desperately wants to keep, and it gives us a political and a social union too. He, on the other hand, wants to pick and mix when everyone knows that they can't. The First Minister says that he's quoted the Mail today, so let me quote The Guardian. When the contradictions of his currency case are presented to him, it says Alex Salmond and co are acting like spoilt children. On the currency, he is weak. On pensions, he is weak. On Europe, he is weak. On the basic facts, he is weak. He is weak, weak, weak. Isn't it true he's the man with no plan? First but Minister. Davidson's weak every week. <laughs> I mean, higher praise I cannot give than the new chairman of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Association. I asked this week in the Daily Telegraph to assess Roof's performance. He said she was improving. I mean, well, be that as it may, if you can't get the endorsement of the chairman, your new chairman of your own party, uh, then I don't think you're in a strong position. Perhaps Ruth Davidson should draw this line in the sand. Yes. The line in the sand might well be 
that we should have a look at the attitudes of the Scottish people as we currently understand them. And I'll tell you this, we can think a number of things about the best constitutional options for Scotland, but there is no doubt, I think, very little doubt, that the reaction to having edicts laid down from on high by yes. George Osborne, yes. how, how shall I put it, has been somewhat negative. <laughs> for the improving Scottish Conservative Party. Now, it may not be of any great moment to the Conservatives. Incidentally, some of the backbenchers were described as coasting in the same article. I don't know which ones are coasting, but it may not be of much moment. All of them, I'm told, all of them are coasting. It may not have much moment to the Conservative Party, who have very little to lose. But what you're doing is dragging down this lot with you. Guilt by association. Question three, will we ready? To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. The next meeting of the Cabinet will discuss issues of importance to the people of Scotland. The First Minister has put on his best poker face this week. But they might not be bluffing. There could be a separate Scottish currency. His own fiscal commission thinks it could be a possibility. John Kay knows it. Patrick Harvey and Dennis Canavan want it. The First Minister is the last man standing refusing to concede. Will he take this opportunity to confirm that a Scottish currency is a possibility? He has a duty to make a statement to Parliament this week or next week so people in Scotland know where they stand. Will he do that? First Minister. Well, I, I, I don't think anybody noticed the, the first sentence of Willie Rennie's question, where he said, might be bluffing. Now, I, I, think, I, think, this is, I think this is improvement. <laughs> I, I think Willie Rennie, in that traditional liberal tradition of, on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that, <laughs> doesn't display the same certainty as the Conservative uh, and Labour Party uh, uh, alliance. Uh, as Willie Rennie should well know, uh, the Fiscal Commission Working Group set out a, a range of options for the currency options of an independent Scotland. They said that these options were viable given the strengths of the Scottish economy. They recommended that the best option for Scotland and for the rest of the United Kingdom was the currency union that we propose. We believe that currency union is the one that will be negotiated. It will be negotiated because it's in the best interests of Scotland and it's most certainly in the best interests of the rest of the United Kingdom, who will not want to be lumbered with the whole of the UK national debt. Will there any? Despite all the opinion, including on his side, he can't even say that it might be a possibility. And he can't hide on that until September. Now, it will be the Chancellor, after a yes vote, if that was to happen, who will have to convince, who he will have to convince about a currency union. The First Minister's whole plan is based on the judgment of that Chancellor, George Osborne. And this is a man he derides for his judgment every day of the week. The First Minister is gambling that Osborne will transform from his belligerent barbarian to his pacifist puppy, arch enemy to best buddy in a day. But John Kay, Patrick Harvey and Dennis Canavan don't think that's going to happen. Two out of three people in that poll that he likes to cite today want the First Minister to set out his alternative. Why is he ignoring them? First Minister. But, but surely if there's a pacifist puppy, and I, w I wouldn't dream of using such language, and I think Willie, su surely it was the person who was giving evidence to this Parliament committee yesterday, Mr Danny Alexander, who seems to be, who seems to be the echo of, of, of the Chancellor of the Exchequer at, at the present moment. I, I've laid out what the Fiscal Commission Working Group said, the alternatives they laid out, and the preferred option, which is our option, of a currency union uh, between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. I, I, I don't believe it's my entreaties that would persuade Danny Alexander or George Osborne uh, to uh, see that in the best interest. I think it's facing up to the realities of the implications of the debt for the rest of the United Kingdom. And I hope 
the realisation that transaction costs north and south of the border are not a good thing for businesses. I, you know, I just look at this vision of George Osborne, Ed Balls, or well, actually Danny Alexander after the independence vote will be on our side, of course. I, sometimes I know that's difficult, but it will be on our side. <laughs> but let's say Osborne and Balls going to all these businesses in the north of England and saying, we've got this fantastic idea. We're going to charge you transaction costs to export your goods and services to Scotland. Come and vote for us. I just don't think uh, that's yeah. credible. And I've actually one thing. I mean, I, I, I keep saying because of Willie Rennie, I don't think he's a lost soul in these things. Because I do detect that there is a bit more reasonableness in terms of Willie's approach to things than sometimes I detect from the other parties. But I did think it was very unreasonable for Danny Alexander to say that an independent Scotland's bond rates would be high yesterday. I mean, given the UK standing at 2.8 per cent, Switzerland 1.1, Denmark 1.7, Austria 1.9, Sweden 2.3, I think there's a lot of evidence that small independent yes. countries across Europe pay lower interest rates than the United Kingdom at the present moment. Question four, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government last met representatives of COSLA and what issues were discussed. First Minister. Well, obviously, ministers and officials meet regularly with representatives of COSLA to discuss a wide range of issues, a part of the commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. One of the issues ministers are currently considering is COSLA's request that we freeze the funding formula for local authorities something I know which is of interest to uh, uh, Ms Watt and the people in her constituency. Morning, Watt. And I thank the First Minister for his answer. As he said, COSLA voted to ask the Scottish Government to freeze the funding formula, a decision I believe uh, supported by Labour-led Aberdeen City Council and count Labour councils throughout Scotland. As I understand it, COSLA can't revisit this without a change to their standing orders, and we see Aberdeen and other Labour councils throwing their dummies out of the pram and proposing to leave that organisation. So can the First Minister set out what it will mean for Aberdeen and what the impact will be on funding for Aberdeen if the Scottish Government accepts COSLA's request? First Minister. Well, to be absolutely clear, I mean, it's COSLA who have put forward this proposal, I understand by a very narrow majority, but nonetheless it is the proposal that COSLA has put forward. John Swinney has considered this and will shortly write to COSLA, outlining the impact of applying the freeze as they propose in comparison to the distributing the funding that local authorities would receive if we use the same method that has been in place since 1983. Now, I will write to Maureen Watt shortly. Uh, setting out the financial implications in particular of the position of Aberdeen City Council and her constituency. However, it is worth noting that it was this SNP Government in 2011 introduced a funding floor ensuring all local authorities should receive 85 per cent of the funding average, after eight years of total inaction by the previous Labour Liberal executive. Uh, and that means that it ensures that Aberdeen currently receives a better deal than it would have had if that measure had not been introduced. But I shall write to Maureen Watt very shortly, pointing out the implications of what has come forward, as we understand it, supported by Aberdeen Council. Cameron Buchanan. Presiding officer, given the confirmed withdrawals from COSLA and the speculation over a number of other local authorities, does the First Minister have a view as to the point at which COSLA can no longer be reasonably seen to represent local authorities in Scotland? And is there any contingency planning for how the government will engage with the local authorities should the organisation reach such a point? First Minister. We discussed this at uh, Cabinet uh, uh, on Tuesday, uh, and so it would be wrong to say we have not considered the prospect, but I think it would be early, and the member is right to, to raise the question, because as he probably knows, there is a time period between signalling an intention to leave the organisation and that leaving the organisation taking uh, effect. Uh, so therefore, I, I think uh, it would probably be in everybody's best interest if we took a calm suit in it and allowed COSLA and the individual councils to, to come to their consideration. But I do think it would probably be helpful to some of the councils if we set out the indicative position that would have been arisen if indeed the same funding formula that has been applied since the 1980s had been applied in the year after next compared to the COSLA proposal. We have to take the COSLA proposal extremely seriously because that is what we have always done. We have said that funding formula is within their gift, but I think it is only important that all of the councils understand and know the implications of what some of them seem to have voted for as part of the considerations within the Labour Group. Patrick Harvey. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. As local government resources uh, shift ever more away from local taxation and towards the block grant, that becoming a, a bigger proportion of local government resources because of central government decisions, not local government decisions, surely the tensions in the allocation of the block grant will only continue to get worse in the long run. Isn't it clear that the uh, freeing up of local government to make local decisions, particularly on local taxation, is an absolutely necessary part of this debate for the longer term, if we want local government to be government. First Minister. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Patrick Harvey makes a, a very fair point, but, but I would say I would dispute that as the reason, as I understand it, for the tensions which are emerging within COSLA. The tensions be, seem to be centred around, as I understand it, two, two areas. One is whether or not the same funding formula which has been used in the 1980s should be applied again, or whether there should be a rollover the year after next of a funding formula that depends on the previous census figures. Uh, that is the, one of the areas of contention. And the other area of contention seems to be that there is some dissatisfaction among some councils in COSLA about the nature of decision making and how much it comes from the leaders group and how much comes uh, from the convention uh, itself. So I dispute the, the reasons for the tension within COSLA, but I think Patrick Harvey makes a, a very important point about the, the politics and economics uh, of local government itself. Question five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government has taken to improve the inspection of care services. First Minister. Well, Alec Neil was tasked to Care Inspector and Healthcare Improvement Scotland to develop new inspections methodology to ensure that older people get the level of support delivered that they have been assessed as needing and that quality is no less than the people of Scotland merit and deserve. As part of this new regime, we require the Care Inspector to inspect every care home in Scotland unannounced at least once every year. Additional inspections are carried out in those services that are at greatest risk. And this means that high-risk services are inspected several times during the year to ensure that improvements are made. Grant. I thank the First Minister for that response, and I'm sure he will join with me welcoming one big drum to the Visitors' Gallery today. Can I also ask if he's aware of Unison Scotland It's Time to Care report, where home care workers highlighted their concerns, once quoted as saying, I think they forget we're dealing with human beings, old ones at that, and another says it's getting worse, I don't know where it's going to end, no one cares about the patient or client anymore. Will the First Minister now heed Scottish Labour's calls to improve health, uh, care inspections and commit to a fully integrated health and social care inspectorate that is independent of government, that is accessible to staff and patients, and has the powers to make the really tough decisions to improve our care services? First Minister. Well, I, I join uh, in welcoming the, the, the big drum uh, to, uh, to, to the Chamber today. I, I think that the member should be fair about the, the nature of the Health Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate and the tasks that they have been carrying forward and the information that we now have, which we did not have before, and the level of inspection that we now have, which we did not have before. Uh, I mean, 31 uh, per cent of home care service users in receipt of 10 hours or more of free personal care a week, 62 per cent in receipt of four or more hours of free personal care per week. Clients are receiving more than double the number of hours of home care that received in 1998, average 5.1 hours a week in 1998, up to 11 hours a week in 2012. Now, the reason that we know these things is because of the nature and regime of inspection that has been carried forward. And while, of course, it is perfectly proper and right, particularly for constituency members, to look to, to failings where things have not worked as they should, at least we know these things now because of the nature of inspection. Integrated health and social care is a priority for the government, as the legislation indicates. But I think the members should be fair about what is actually happening and the work that is being done, which identifies failings and sorts them out. Question six, Liz Smith. First, First Minister, what discussions the Scottish Government has had with Glasgow 2014 officials regarding the financial administration of the Commonwealth Games? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has frequent meetings with Glasgow 2014 regarding all aspects of the Games preparations, including financial arrangements. The funding partners remain confident that delivery remains on time and will be achieved within the agreed budget. Well, uh, thank you, First Minister. There were uh, reports ten days ago in the Sunday Herald that two thirds of the £42 million contingency fund has already been spent and that part of the reason for this is that the organisers have underestimated the timescale of hiring certain various, sorry, various venues and that in turn has led uh, to a number of contracts being revisited. Could the First Minister tell me how many 
contracts have been revisited? First Minister. Well, what I can say is that 92 per cent of contracts by value have now been committed, leaving only 8 per cent of the contracts. And given that 92 per cent is much higher than 66 per cent of the contingency fund, it is one of the reasons why there is a great deal of confidence in terms of staying on time and within budget. Uh, can, I, can I say, in terms of the organising committee, uh, I've looked at uh, a range of games uh, across uh, the world, both Commonwealth and Olympics. Uh, in comparison, the, the Glasgow Games, I think by general, certainly in terms of the, the overall Commonwealth Federation, what they acknowledge that the Glasgow Games is one of the, the best run, most efficient, within t- on time and on budget. And one of the reasons for confidence is we are now at a stage where just about all of the venues are completed, where 92 per cent of the contracts have been committed. And that is why there is a great deal of confidence that not only will the Games be on time and on budget, but it will be one of the the greatest sporting and cultural festivals that Scotland has ever seen. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to uh, members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly, and I will allow a short pause to allow them to do so.